Mulung Muluk, Narek Melinda Kennedy, Wadarang Barangirk, Wadaki, Delama, Naru, Wadarang, Wadarang Ja. I'd like to welcome you to Jilang. Caring for a man for 32 years, my ancestors are the champions in this story. They took someone in, fed, guided, and taught Buckley how to live a sustainable life in this beautiful country that we live in. Significant cultural places in Jilang and surrounds are named after Buckley. I'd like you to recognise in Reconciliation Week this imbalance in the built environment and think of the Wadarung places they have left without your recognition. Kunawari, Waran, La, Jeringha, Badara, Yaniki, Mulapi, Murabu, Burabu, Motawari, Baniong. Wadarung is an ancient, sophisticated community that worked as a strong force of support and should be recognised for their high standards of humanity, intelligence and care before anyone else on this earth. Nala, Nala, La, Ba, Gupnya, Gupma, Nara, Dep, Mokberi. I say welcome. Thank you, Melinda Kennedy, for providing that wonderful welcome to country ceremony on behalf of the Wadarung. Melinda is a higher degree of research student undertaking her master's at the School of Architecture and Built Environment at Deakin University and her subject is Indigenous Knowledge Systems of the Built Environment throughout Australian Universities. Melinda is acknowledged in Adam Courtney's book for her contribution from Wadarong Perspectives. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I'm presenting on Wadarong Country. I acknowledge Elders past and present and future, and I acknowledge the hurt that Aboriginal people suffer as we speak about Reconciliation Week this week. I stand with you today, this week, and always. So good evening to you, the audience. My name is Heather Threadgold. I am an anthropologist by trade and about to complete my PhD for part of almost 20 years of knowledge and research on Aboriginal landscape and living spaces in Victoria. And on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I would like to welcome you to the library author event this evening. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this special event in honour of Reconciliation Week, which in 2020 marks 20 years of shaping Australia's journey towards a more just, equitable and reconciled nation. This year's theme is All In This Together, which seems incredibly apt at this time of COVID-19 restrictions. Reconciliation is a journey for all Australians as individuals, families, communities, organisations, and importantly, as a nation. At the heart of this journey are relationships between the broader Australian community and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. On this journey, Australians are all in this together. Every one of us has a role to play when it comes to reconciliation. And in playing our part, we collectively build relationships and communities that value Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's histories and cultures. Now, just before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping matters. It looks like we have around 150 people joining us this evening, which is fantastic. So thank you all for registering online and joining us this evening. Now, so housekeeping, so that you can participate in this live webinar uh, towards the end mostly, but throughout the, the, um, the evening, you can click on the Q&A button and type your question or comment. So we will have question time at the end. And as I said, you can ask throughout. Now you may need to touch your screen to see the Q&A and chat function 
if you're using an iPad or an iPhone to join us tonight. I'll give you a moment to get organised. Now, if you would like to watch this discussion again or recommend to friends or family, you can watch it via the library's website tomorrow. And that is www.grlc.vic.gov.au. Right, now down to the fun part. I have the great pleasure of introducing author Adam Courtney. Adam is a writer and journalist who has a long career in the UK and Australia, writing for publications such as the Financial Times, the Sunday Times, the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and the Australian Financial Review. He is also the best-selling author of The Ship That Never Was, the true life escape story of convict sailor and anti-hero James Porter whose memoirs were the inspiration for Marcus Clark's For the Term of His Natural Life. A fantastic tale if you haven't read it, and it is available at the library. Tonight, Adam is joining us from his home in Sydney to discuss the book, Go The Ghost and the Bounty Hunter, William Buckley, John Batman, and the Theft of the Coolin Nation. Welcome, Adam. Oh, thank you for having me, Heather. I'm really, really great to be here in Waterwurrung country, or at least broadcasting to Waterwurrung country anyway. It's fantastic. Thank you. It is. And, you know, we're in unusual circumstances here. Yeah. Um, you know, we had to do our own hair and makeup this evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it look, it works online, doesn't it? We've got the yes, audience it with us. Um, yeah. Now, I have read your book. Oh, great. And yeah, it, it's a good read. So oh, we're here oh, to, to delve into the um, in intricacies of the book this evening and, and sure. um, I'm looking forward to it. That, me too. All right. So you're ready to get the discussion going? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Let's go. I'm... Okay. I've got a, a, a list of questions here. Um, right. So let's start with the first one, the story of William Buckley. Now, individually, the characters of the book, such as Buckley, Batman and Faulkner, they've left long lasting impressions upon Australians. And these guys are embedded into not only colonial Victorian history, but remain so in the contemporary world today. Now their names exist as suburbs, as some of you will know, Buckley Falls here in the Geelong area, roads and so on. Yet very few know the details of the story or the layers of hurt that they created for Aboriginal people. This is particularly raw during such times as Reconciliation Week, which we contemplate today. So Adam, for those who are unaware of the story you're portraying, without giving away too much, tell us the crux of the tale. Yeah, look, um, it, it, I'll try to tell it as succinctly as possible, but that's not very succinct because it's quite a long story. But um, uh, really, it's just to get the basics here. I mean, it's a story about a convict, uh, um, William Buckley, who lived with the Wadawurrung people of the area for 32 years. He, he lost his English language and he came out uh, the other side, if you like, when Melbourne was founded in 1835. Um, but to me, what I see it as from the very start, it's also a story about, I think it's a story about dispossession in, in not just in the obvious ways, but in, in other ways. Um, Buckley, I, I always felt uh, for most of his life was dispossessed of any kind of normal freedom. So if you go right mm. back to his background in England, uh, when, when he's, where he started, you know, he was, he was interestingly, and it's quite canny, I think that he was dispossessed of his own land uh, when he was a child in Cheshire in the early uh, 1790s. Um, what happened was that um, the army wanted land to grow crops uh, for the wars against the French. Uh, th they knew these wars were coming against uh, the French. It was fairly obvious after the French Revolution. Uh, and and, and his, he and his family were simply ousted. They were just told to go. Um, no. So that's the first dispossession, if you like. Um, then I think, that I think of another dispossession. Uh, he was dispossessed of the right to be educated. Now that sounds a bit weird, but let me explain. Uh, but that 
that wasn't untypical of his generation. I mean, he what, what he really was was a poor farm boy in a little tiny town called Martin in Cheshire. Um, and, and these poor farm boys, the way I see it uh, in this book, and I think I make it fairly clear, they were kind of, uh, if you like, um, the kind of the, the playthings of the powerful. Um, what, what could an illiterate boy, farm boy do? Well, he was sent into apprentices, apprenticeships, uh, or mm. sent into the Navy or something. But always these apprenticeships, apprenticeships, if I can say that properly, they're always drudgery. You know, uh, he was, Buckley was sent in to be a bricklayer. Uh, then, then after that, he said, I've had enough of this and I'm going to go into the army and, and fight Napoleon in the late 1790s. And then, uh, like so many, uh, as we all know, this country started, uh, he was sent down the colonies as a convict to the shores of Port Phillip. Now, he escaped from that area. Um, this is the area uh, you guys would know better than me, I'm sure. The area we now know is Sorrento. And after a few months, was supposedly, or there's a couple of stories about this, but he supposedly found dead by three uh, Wadawurrung women and who took him in as kin. Thereafter, for the next 32 years of being part of society, he was part of their society, I should say, uh, that was 32 years, and then John Batman's people came in 1835. We know the founding of Melbourne, um, and he was then asked to be kind of go between between Europeans and and the indigenous people. Um, well, this is what I think he came a bit unstuck. Uh, he watched on while he saw yet another dispossession uh, mm -hmm. of the people he had lived with for those 30 odd years. Um, he left two years after in, in 1837 and went to live an extremely quiet life in Tasmania. And in the 1850s, wrote about his life with the help of a ghost writer, uh, John Morgan, which we're going to talk about, I think, later. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's sort of the, I hope that's, that's kind of the bare bones of the story of, from the very beginning to, to the end, but very, very sketchy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sets the scene beautifully. Oh, okay. um, you know, it's introducing the man, it's introducing this, these layers of, as you say, dispossession. Um, fascinating, it's a fascinating tale. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a bit more about Buckley. Um, you know, he was, so you say, you know, he wasn't educated. He sort of seemed to blunder through life and really didn't achieve anything. I mean, um, and yet here we are talking about him 185 years later when he met Batman, just up the road here from yep. Geelong. Yeah. Um, and through your research, you know, what 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 are your thoughts on on Buckley? I mean, you sort of you sort of just gave a bit of an outline then. But yeah, I gave something, and I, and if I repeat myself, forgive me. But look, no. I, I, I like I like the word they use there, blundered, and I think it's a yeah. really um, you said he blundered through life. I think um, mm. I think it's a really apt one. In so in so in so many ways, I think he was a kind of um, bungling every man if you like <laughs> he was a 20 year old convict convict when he found himself um alone on the shores of bass strait in in the wilderness well the wilderness according to white man of course mm. he had absolutely no bushcraft uh but let's, let's if i'm going to sum up sort of what he was physically um let's remember one incredibly important thing about buckley is that he was uh six foot five in the old metric uh, the old imperial terms which is 198 centimeters um, he was an extremely powerful man. He was huge. I mean, I think I'm five foot seven and I'm considered a bit of a midget. Uh, in, if I was in those days, if I was five foot seven, I would be a tall guy. Now he was six foot five. So he was absolutely gargantuan. Uh, and so he, he was extremely powerful. Uh, and he believed probably because of his physical abilities that he had the ability to survive in the wilderness. Um, trying to describe who he was, uh, you know, it's only my impression, but I think he was a gentle giant but had a great, a kind of quiet, quiet determination to survive. Um, I sort of talked about this before, so I'm maybe sort of repeating, but uh, a man who had been told all his life what to do as a bricklayer or in the army. And finally, of course, as a convict, you didn't have any freedom whatsoever. Um, mm. And, you know, he, he had no means to freedom, no, no means of self-expression. You know, he was sent here, he was told to do this, he was mm. requisitioned for something, ordered to do something else. Um, you know, his generation of, of, of um, uh, I described him before as a poor farm boy, which is really what he was. Mm. They were expected to do everything that his superiors told him. Um, and 
for Barclay to borrow uh, uh, this ex existential expression, the hell of his life was other people. And that, what were the other people? That was the state, the army, um, the penal authorities, and even some of his mates uh, who had kind of led him astray. And, you know, uh, it was a mate that he supposedly stole the cloth from that sent him down. So, uh, you know, he was being, you know, blundering. I think that's the word we use. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But, 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 but let's let's change the tack. Once he had become semi-established, if you like, in Wadawurrung country, I think he could finally be a man. And arguably, um, we could say he was even a Wadawurrung man. Um, he realised early on that he had to be uh, accommodating of, he, of his newfound kin. And he realised that to get on, he, he had to learn the land and the protocols, the importance of kinship which I'm told uh, is still very much the cornerstone of, of Indigenous society. Um, he had to understand his new place in this world. And I think he, he did pretty well for a poor farm boy who, didn't, who had no bushcraft and obviously had never met uh, Indigenous people before. Um, mm. um, you asked me a bit about who he was as a man, uh, you know, certain circumstances change what we see in uh, his abilities. I mean, when the, when the Europeans came in 1835, uh, Buckley was forced to make some difficult choices. Um, and the basic, most basic of that was, um, was he a European or was he a Wadawurrung man? Um, mm -hmm. And this is where the obvious problem comes in. He was, by the Europeans, he was considered half savage. They, simply, they, they really didn't just, they just didn't get who he was or what his experiences were. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course his, uh, uh, you know, Wadawurrung family most likely thought he had gone over to, I, I say, gone over to the dark side uh, now because he was with the Europeans. So yes, oh yes, uh, and we do, and we'll touch on that a little bit further. Actually, we'll go we'll go down a little bit deeper into that a little bit further. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah, and just going back to um, him, I mean, he did spend a lot of time on his own too, didn't he? Yeah. Um, uh, he was here and on Wadawurrung country. Yeah, he spent a lot of time. I mean, um, I, I think I will talk about it a little later, but, um, you know, he had, it, it wasn't like he had a perfect immersion in, in Aboriginal life. Um, he had uh, a couple of occasions where he, apart, some of his family were supposedly killed by this um, foreign uh, foreign tribe. He got very upset for obvious reasons, that's his, his Wadawurrung family. And he went off um, and went, uh, for want of a better word, he just went on his own for many years. He didn't want to be yeah. part. And so he 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 had he had that. He wasn't complete. I'm not saying that. You may say that he might have been a Wadawurrung man. Oh, that's you know contestable. I'm not sure. But not everything about Aboriginal life was perfect for him, and he mm. wanted to spend time. And I think he was a loner anyway. So he just yeah. wanted to do his own thing. Um, I think that's a fair summation of it. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, just Jude just has a quick question and I can quickly answer that. Um, that Sorrento wasn't part of the Wadawurrung people. No, that was Bunurong no. land. No, it's just Bunurong, to, yeah. Um, confirm that, um, that question. Excellent. So um, let's move on to something else. Um, so there's much speculation as to Buckley's story. Yep. The journalist Morgan he yeah. wrote the story in an era of sens sensationalism of highlighting Aboriginal people as the other. Yeah. And equal to this, the colonists at Port Phillip at this time were all well known to each other. It was a really small place. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Wedge and Batman, he, they mentioned Buckley in their works as well. Yeah. But yeah. very little is really spoken from Buckley himself, it seems. Yep. Now, was this story manipulated, in your opinion, to please the yearning audience at the time of the release of Morgan's book, yeah. or do you think it was a genuine attempt at re relaying a true account? Uh, there was definitely a manip manipulation, um, uh, and but there's been a lot of controversy over Morgan's book. Um, um, what I will say is that I think it has had some value, uh, but, but it must hardly be taken as a kind of gospel. Um, and I think what, what, what you understand is when it was written. It was written in 1852, and I think, uh, please forgive me if I'm wrong about this because I'm a New South Welshman, uh, but I think Victoria had just become a state in its own right, or was about to be. Um, yeah. uh, for, for, so this account, let's, let's put that in perspective, it was written by, for want of a better word, 
I don't, I, you know, I don't mean this in the sense that, that it was the people who had taken over, the victors. So the, the victors, as it were, had taken over. And this was now a new state that wanted to form its identity. Um, and all states, when they come into being, you think of the United States, they, they, were derived, they all say they were derived from good, strong principles of, of justice and fairness. So that was kind of the, the zeitgeist, the feeling that was current at the time. So the victors always want to tell the story and they always get to tell the story. Um, the story was as much, you'll see in the Morgan account that in many accounts, they denigrate the Aboriginal people, the Wadawurru and in fact, all the Kulin people. Um, why did they do that? Because the past 20 years had seen the Wadawurru, including the other Kulin nations, it all the people of the Kulin were dispossessed of their land and deracinated. Um, and everyone who was reading the account at that time would have known that. So Morgan had to explain why. And the reason he did was to inform his readers that this was a deficient culture, which we, the upstanding civilized Europeans, had supplanted. So according to Morgan, we, they had rightly supplanted these people. That's a subtext. So that, because these people weren't good enough. And that's why when you see, in the, I'm trying to get back to your question. You mm -hmm. see in this book um, that Morgan talks about um, them being engaged in uh, endlessly quarreling, uh, kill, they're killing each other over apparently nothing. They were apparently engaged in barbaric acts of cannibalism, cannibalism and infanticide. This is all complete BS. There's mm. never been a verified act of cannibalism among any Aboriginal tribes in Australia. But mm. he's writing these things in a way, um, I hope this makes sense, to clear his conscience and to make themselves feel superior. We supplanted this, these people because they were not good enough. They were inferior. So that's why Morgan would have put a lot of this stuff, the sensational stuff, the cannibalism, the infanticide, he put it into this. And it's absolutely, it's just to, one, it's, to, it's a crowd pleaser. It's every, everybody, oh, these, these people are terrible. No, one, no matter we took over. Um, but it's a complete malarkey, of course. Um, and he wanted to make a blockbuster. He wanted to make it sound like these people were, you know, savage people. Um, and what better than to pander the prejudices at that time? So putting other putting down the original inhabitants makes you feel somehow superior. So there was that going on at this time in the 1850s. But, and it's a pretty big but, I do feel that when reading the Morgan account, um, Buckley's voice came through and, and often quite clearly. Um, and I feel many of his experiences with the water room were pretty genuine. So the lifestyle, the ways of trading with other people, the making of eel traps, the hunting and finding of food, uh, there are episodes where some of his family were killed. I mentioned that before uh, because they were accused of sorcery. I, you know, I'm not 100% sure, but these ring very true to me. Uh, he describes things like uh, the wageries, the message men. Um, he, he gives some scenes of set battles that occurred that felt true. There's a corroboree scene that to me seems authentic. Um, but I, I am the first to admit, I'm hardly the best judge of these things. But so... To answer your question in a very roundabout way, on a macro le level, we had Morgan pandering to prejudices, and on a micro level, we had Buckley describing aspects of his life with the water room, which I, which felt true to me. Um, mm -hmm. And many of his responses to, it, to the events he described seem to be real responses. So there's a lot of truth, and there's a lot of BS in this account as well. And that's so that's that's the long and short of it, as I saw it anyway. Yes, look, that's right, and you and and you and you write about that. Um, and I think also from Buckley's perspective is that he was also, you know, out of respect for what are people. He also didn't um, talk about certain things. Yes, uh, exactly. He, mm. he, he never talked. Um, it's a good point. It was always often asked, um, why didn't he ever talk very much in his account about religion? And um, in fact, um, I, I, I saw, um, I, I can't remember his... I, I, this question was asked of a Wadawurrung man, um, a man named, I don't remember his first name, Tunier, uh, a few years ago. And he said, well, Aboriginal people don't talk about their religion. As, this is what I heard him say anyway. Mm. Uh, it's private and it's nothing that, that he, they do. So that gives a slight more authenticness because he didn't want to mention what he felt about uh, his religious convictions. And that never comes through in the book as well. So that yeah. gives a ring of more authenticity that he didn't talk about that, uh, I think. Yes, that's right. It's what are our stories, it's what are our knowledge. Exactly. And, it's and their knowledge and it's nobody else's. So he, exactly. 
Yeah, that's right. And he did have a level of respect for that, um, so it seems. Well, let's move on to John Batman. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, interesting fellow. He married Eliza, who, funnily enough, came to her demise here in Geelong West. In oh, fact, right. I didn't know that, actually. I, did, I didn't know did that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know. Uh, well, that's another story altogether. Uh, we'll get, yeah. <laughs> And a really interesting one because, in fact, you know, she came to her demise just around the corner from where, where I live here. Oh, um, God. Yeah, I can, I can almost see the spot. Okay. And now when she um, came to her demise, okay. his daughters were then raised by Anne Drysdale and Caroline Newcomb. Now, they were two women who, who were early colonists um, who ran properties on their own. Um, very unusual for women during this time. Um, and there are two names that we're familiar with here in Geelong. Um, we have Drysdale and, and Newcomb suburbs named after both women. Um, so that's also another interesting story as well, all these side stories that, that go along with this tale. Um, and Batman, who is a dubious character with weak tendencies, he contracted syphilis from Eliza. And she had a very shady past, I can tell you, Adam. <laughs> okay. You know a lot about Eliza, far more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion of Batman as a uh, Look, you, you mentioned that weak tendencies. That, that's interesting mm -hmm. uh, because when he was a, a youth, he apparently got involved with a, a local woman and, and we believe may have impregnated her and then was told in, in the sort of, uh, you better run away because even though you say you're not the father, it's just not a good look. So I think he was a bit of a, a, a man around town quite early in his career. Um, now my opinion of Batman, look, I'm going to cheat here. You're not going to expect this. I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to quote something from another book. I don't know if you've heard of this book. It's just come out called Truganini by Cassandra Pibus. Uh, it's a wonderful book about the life of Truganini. Um, and in it, she gives a description of Batman that's far better than anything I've ever written. And I wonder if it's okay if I, it's only a few par, pars, paragraphs. Go for it. And um, so she's going to do all the hard work for me. And I'm actually going to tell you what I think afterwards. But this pretty much tells you what he was thought of uh, by many people um, in, in Tasmania before he came over to, uh, to Victoria. Um, now, let me see. This is from G.A. Robinson talking about Batsman. George, George Augustus Robinson was a man who did the friendly mission, so-called friendly mission, around Tasmania to round up uh, the Palawa, the, the Palawa people of, um, that's another story, but um, here's the story that Robinson gives. Um, um, and it talks about, in this book, it talks about the, the black line. Um, you've probably heard of that, where the men went down to try to uh, uh, pretty much corral every, every uh, Aboriginal person, every Indigenous person. And this has started, and Robinson wasn't very happy about it. And he says that, she says, I should say, now that the governor's priorities, the governor's priorities had changed from conciliation, i.e. not, that it used to be conciliation. Um, first, he was, they changed from conciliating the original people to removing them from the colony. Robinson's mission, Robinson's mission was no longer a friendly meet and greet. His instructions were made to make contact with the remaining people and get them to accompany him to the coast. He was then to signal to John Batman, who would be waiting with an armed party in boats at Spring Bay to come and take them away. That was never going to happen. Robinson loathed John Batman and deeply resented the fact that the governor, as Governor Arthur, had given this ruffian, Batman, equal authority to, ruffian, to Robinson. For the past two years, this is where it goes, Batman had been in charge of roving parties, tracking the, the, the clan of Ben Lamond and the clan near the Piper River set region, this is the, the Palawa there, who were implicated in occasional attacks on stockkeepers. His method, this is, this is, Batman's method was to launch surprise night attacks on their camps, killing as many men and youths as he could. Women and young children were the only captives of his roving parties turned over to the authorities, although some of the boy children he kept for himself. Like his friend John held a wedge, Batman liked to have boys living with him. Make of that what you will. Terrible stories about Batman's unbridled violence had reached Robinson in December 1829 when he rescued Batman's women captives and their children from brutal conditions in jail. 
And the last sentence is, no way was Robinson going to allow a murderous lout like Batman into his operation. So that's Batman. Uh, I hope that gives a sense of what people thought of him in, um, intelligent people thought about him uh, in Tasmania. He was considered a murderous lout. Um, and I, I agree with it perfectly. Um, I, I would probably only add that uh, Batman was two-faced. He would do anything for power and prestige. Uh, when he finally launched his bid for land in Port Phillip, um, uh, he was already in the second and third stages of syphilis. But he, the lust for this kind of prestige was still there, even when he was evidently dying from this disease. Um, I think the bid for Coolin land was his, was his last grasp at, for immortality. He wanted to be seen as the biggest, the best, the most powerful, even when he clearly was dying and wasn't so. Um, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what I think of Batman. Not a great deal. Um, a very brilliant man, a great, a great bushman, to say for him, and very capable of paying both sides of the fence. But um, not a good man, I think, is the right, the right answer for that. <laughs> yes, and look, he, you know, he probably lived half the age of, of, of other people. He only know. made it to 39, exactly. He only made 39, it to yeah, exactly. yeah. So, well... Yes, very interesting. Very interesting that he was. So, um, yeah, Cassandra Piper yeah. said it better than me. So uh, there's there's something. Yeah, that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting book by the sounds of it. And um, yeah. she did. Um, I'm reading it at the moment, and it was just last night I read that package, passage. And I thought I've just got to quote that when when I, hopefully you ask me about Batman the next day. <laughs> yes, and that he was released from Tasmania after all of that over here. You know, it's um. Yeah. Shocking, really, isn't it? No, no, it's, uh, you know, it's a terrible story, really. Um, well, um, now we might go back to, to Buckley a little bit. But first, James Dawson. Yeah. He was a settler in Gulagin and Kirrawarong country. And his daughter and him, um, his daughter Isabella, they spent time with Aboriginal people and wrote the book uh, Australian Aborigines in a 1881. Dawson was known in his old age as a grumpy old bugger <laughs> and he had become an advocate uh, for human rights for Aboriginal people. Yeah. Now this was a real problem for the Western District reputation at the time where pastoralism was thriving. Dawson and others became frustrated with their colonial peers for the lack of ignorance and underestimation of Aboriginal people. So Dawson was ad advocating at a time um, when two worlds were colliding. Towards the end of Buckley's life, Buckley became an intermediate between the two worlds and he too shied away from his peers. In 2020, writing this novel, you as a writer are placing yourself sometimes between two worlds. How do you feel about writing this story? I mean, do you understand the conflictive elements to this era more deeply as a white Australian now? Yeah, look, I hope I, hope I do. Um, I, I'll ask the first part of the question, I think, which you, how do I feel uh, uh, um, about writing the story? First, I, when I was writing it, I didn't felt, um, feel educationally or intellectually equipped to write it at all. I mean, uh, it, it made... Uh, I also knew that this made me pro pro pretty typical of my generation and background. I mean, who am I? I'm a Sydney boy writing about an era long ago, about a man I never met, uh, an area I know from only one or two visits, about a people whose culture, life and ways of doing things uh, I barely know about. Um, what am I doing here? I don't know. But I have to say, um, it was an empowering process for me to learn something of the water wrong late ways. And I came out of it in awe and wonder. It's just how incredibly um, adept these people were at cultivating their land and, and living with such, uh, I like to use the expression, eloquent. It wasn't just sustainability. It wasn't just getting it. It was eloquent sustainability. Um, I always felt way out of my depth and I was really lucky. Um, I, I met and became friends with a, a Dr. Fred Carr, who's an expert in Aboriginal studies at, at Federation University, who, if you like, uh, was kind of my mentor. He mentored me through the history. He'd written his own book about the Wadawurrung and their history. Uh, my country, it's called My Country All Gone, The White Men Have Stolen It, which pretty much tells you what it's all about. Uh, and I have to tell you, with, without his help and guidance, this would have been a very different and, and in, I think probably an inferior piece of work, uh, the whole book. 
So I was really lucky in having someone oversee so much of this. Um, so the upshot is from feeling weight on my depth, uh, as I said at the beginning, I, then I'm lucky to be standing on the shoulders of a particular giant. Uh, having this kind of expertise to fall back on, it gave me the, the, the confidence to write a, I think hopefully, and of course the reader is the one who's gonna judge, but I think it's a better, more engaging story. If, if I could get at least some of the elements of the culture and et cetera right, then I can write the main story, which is what I, which is the main thing of what I was trying to do. Um, I wanted to write a human story in the midst of a greater, more important historic one. You know, Buckley's, mm. I think Buckley's story is an amazing one itself because he, was a, he really was there at the crossroads of an important history, the founding of Melbourne. Um, I, I think you had another question. Um, what do I, how, um, do I ask as a white Australian whether I understand the, the conflictive elements more deeply? Uh, yeah. uh, the answer, of course, is yes. Um, I, what can I say? I know my generation that I'm 56, we were never given the information we should have had from the outset uh, to know what this nation was and how, you know, and how it became, how it began. Um, you know, it's, it reminded me when you asked me this question uh, years ago, I think it was around the 1970s. I, I remember seeing a Four Corners program where a whole bunch of young Germans were asked a simple question, who was Adolf Hitler? Uh, even the 12 to 15 year olds didn't know really the full story. It was hidden from them. Mm. Um, now that has changed and I think Germans are pretty much know their history and they're, they're well, well, well apprised. But I, I kind of think Australians like me are a bit like those young Germans. We hadn't been given the full truth. And when we are, it's kind of battered away uh, as yes, oh, they did those terrible things way back there in those days. I mean, I think John Howard in the 90s or the early 2000s said, why should we be blamed for what our ancestors did? Well, uh, we are what we are because of what they did. Um, I'm not a political person. Uh, I try not to be, but I, what I do feel as a, as a former, as a journalist, that if you make it, you have to make a decision on anything, you, you can't make it without knowing the full story. And I hope mm. that, I hope that this book does some small way to tell more of a full story uh, and that others will, will find little Buckley type stories that we didn't know about. Because um, that's the other thing. No one, everybody knew this expression, who's got Buckley's here, up here where I am in New South Wales. No one knew, knew who Buckley was. It's, uh, and then I've seen a lot of iconography about Buckley. There's a lot of great paintings about him. Um, there's, you know, uh, you know, the more you understand, the more we know, and the more we can make really good decisions about things. It's just basically that. So yeah. I hope that sort of answers the best I possibly can, um, the question. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel ashamed, but at the same time, let's, let's, let's do a better job. It's not too late, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's right, that's right. So you, you answered that nicely, thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, and, I hope so. Uh, well, and look, you. as a writer, I mean, you're always shifting between, you know, two worlds. This is the challenge of being a writer, I, I imagine. Um, yeah. So, you know, there are these, um, that's part of the challenge of, of and excitement of being a writer. Um, so... Yeah, well, that's what I love about it. You know, uh, involving myself in this, I mean, I can't tell you how my perspective has changed since writing this book. It's just been you know, mm. from zero to a hundred in 10 seconds, it really has. Yeah, that's right. I think, um, you know, the Australian colonial history is really coming to light at the moment. Um, I think it is, and it's great. I think people are really saying, what the hell, let's tell it like it was. And I think that's a great thing for the kids in the next 10, 15, 20 years. They will know the real version of things. And it won't be the yes. stock textbooks that probably you had, Heather, you probably had the same thing, I don't know. Um, but a lot of us did, and it was just really nothing, <laughs> nothing that what yes. we really need to know. I just remember learning about the Incas in Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end um, of your history, okay. <laughs> and British, you know, that's what we learned at school, but now there's um, traditional owners are coming into classes and teaching. It's fantastic, um, isn't it? And incorporated into to writing curriculum. I think that's really really special and, and it's fantastic you know, no it's it really is you know, I'm, you know it's great stuff yeah yeah that's, that's right that's right and i think melinda's um master's sounds exciting with um indigenous knowledge systems in um in universities which will be exciting too Look. um now we have got some questions piling up so we'll, i'll quickly move on to the next little bit but i did ask you if you wanted to um 
read a, pa a little passage from your book. Did you? Yeah. Uh, if, have we got? How are we going for time? What, when, when are we? Uh... Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes before question time. So... Okay. If we've still got a bit of time, look, I'll, I'll do a very. I'll try to. Uh, I'll try not yes. to speak too quickly because uh, it, you may not understand if I go through it quick too quickly. But it's all good. We'll, but, we'll... Look, let, uh, it's a couple of pages. This is from the prologue, the very beginning, um, and it's about basically when Buckley first comes into view. So when you read this book, hopefully you will. This is what you'll you'll start off as. I think uh, I think it was my favourite little passage anyway. Um, so it's a prologue. Uh, let's start at around two p.m. on the sixth of July, eighteen thirty-five. The ever alert John Pigeon gasped and dropped his billy can. P Pigeon was a well-travelled Aboriginal man from the southern coast of New South Wales. He had worked for the wealthy grazier John Batman in Van Diemen's Land for nearly a decade. He had travelled and walked with many tribes throughout the continent. He had lived with the Palawa and European sealers on the coast of Tasmania. He had seen many things, but he had never seen this. A giant appeared at the far end of the camp. He was so clearly a white man and so clearly not. He was the tallest and most powerful human Pigeon had ever laid eyes on. He was a middle-aged, he was middle-aged, his complexion ruddy and sunburnt, his gray beard falling below his chest. He held his gaze on the eight men in camp with just the slightest hint of suspicion. The man was shoeless and dressed in well-worn, well-worn possum skins. In his left hand, he carried a giant mongile, a uh, double barbed spear 10 feet in height, the most feared of all weapons. In his right, a wadi or club known as a kudjuron, designed to strike opponents on the head. At his feet, he had a number of boomerang shank wongwing, excuse my, my terrible pronunciation, but wongwim, I think it is, the first recourse in battle designed to break legs and inflict heavy wounds. He held these implements lightly and deftly, the way pigeons people did. His stance and bearing showed he knew how to use them but his mien was unmistakably that of a white man. And yet only an indigenous person could have come in so close to camp without Pigeon noticing. White men knew nothing of stealth. Pigeon, one of Batman's most brilliant trackers, never missed a thing. By Pigeon's estimation, this man had the bearing of a white Narangeta, the elder man, an elder man of knowledge. There was no other name for what he now saw. In a few moments, everyone in the camp had seen the man. There was a few gasps, then nobody spoke. The three white and five Aboriginal men sat transfixed, looking in wonder at each other, then back at the apparition. But there was no alarm. Nobody rushed to their guns. Nobody moved. It was as if a spirit had come to visit them, floating in from a place nobody could quite divine, hovering for reasons none could understand. It was an astonishing spirit, but not a harmful one. The giant betrayed no, no emotion. Soon he sat at the edge of the camp, not far from where Pigeon and his men had set up their tents. He was impassive, almost motionless, looking askance at everyone. His war and hunting implements were now propped be between his legs. Eventually the stunned silence wore off and the sprightly James Gum, an ex-convict from Southampton, walked over to the man and started talking. The man showed no signs of comprehension. It's probable, probable he, had some, he had some understanding of Gum's working class Hampshire accent, but his tongue movements, Buckley's tongue movements in relation to his upper palate had changed since he'd last spoken to a fellow white man. He couldn't remember, let alone form the English words that, he had, want, that had once come naturally. He also didn't want to say who he was, not just yet. He first wanted to figure out if these men were friendly. They cut up a piece of bread and handed it over to him. Then he remembered. He later described it as a cloud passing over his brain. Bread, he said. It was the first English word he had uttered in 32 years. And that's the start. Wow, lovely, thank you. Uh, that, and, that's of interest to people. <laughs> and what a thought it must have been to see this huge man. You yeah, know? I think I think that I, I try to show it as uh, you know from a slight, from another perspective how mm. how he would have been seen as so, kind of Aboriginal, but. Kind of white. He was definitely white, but he had he wasn't the average white that was walking into camp at that point. So yeah, yeah that, that's that's the point of that photo. Just show to show people what had happened, I think. To and, what... and for that period of long period of time, he's almost forgotten his own language. I mean, it's um, so that's a great yeah. start to the book. I mean, that really gets you um, um, inspired to keep going there. Yeah. Well, I hope so. You know, I hope, I hope people will find that an interesting way. And then they'll think, hopefully, that gives them, who is this man? And we're going to tell you from here on what he is, who he is. And that's, the, <laughs> that's Buckley himself, yeah. 
brilliant, brilliant. So before we go on to question time, um, I just wanted to ask what's next for you, Adam? What, what's your um, next story? That's the easiest question to answer. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I think it'll be a probably, I, I think I'm, I'll tell you what it isn't. It's, 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 I don't think I'll be doing any more, well, for a while anyway, any more uh, convict stories. Uh, I've done two of them already. Uh, I want to move on to something else, more something, it might be late, mid to late um, uh, 19th century. And I want to try and do something about Sydney, where I actually come from, because I've been doing it about everywhere else except for where I come from. Um, and I've got, I've got a few ideas, but I can't really say until the, the publisher uh, has, has come, has, has agreed them. But uh, all I can say is you'll have to, it'll be a Sydney story, probably not a convict story, and, um, but, but it will have a colonial aspect to it, I think. Fantastic. It's a great era to write about. You oh, know, it's, it's, it's there's fun. so much to talk about. You know, I, I love it. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you often have a little, like a little break? I mean, you can't have a holiday because we can't really go anywhere at the moment, but do you normally yeah. have a bit of a, a break? Well, my, my dad, yeah, I, I, I just, my dad used to talk, brag about doing a book every year. It's, in, I couldn't do it. Uh, okay. the, the amount of work that goes into a non-fiction book, I, I, I'm going to say this, people probably might disagree. The amount of work that has to go in the research to get everything absolutely right in a non-fiction book is far greater than it is in a fiction book, which is what my dad did. Mm -hmm. I cannot do two in one year, two in one a year. I, I'm hoping to do it every couple of years. Uh, if the publisher says yes, the publisher has to say yes uh, and before anything happens at all. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I do want to break from doing it because I think, I think it is possible to overwrite. If you're writing every year, it's, mm. you know, I, w I want time to think things over. And mm. so I would say that you won't see it. If there's going to be anything at all, God, God forbid, we <laughs> hope there will be, it'll be in 2020, what are we, 2022. Um, oh, that's nice because, you, you know, you want that time to immerse. I can understand yeah. what you're saying there to yeah. really deeply immerse into that. Yeah. Well, now it's time to open up to you, the audience. Um, question time. So I have a couple lined up here. Um, we might start with these and then if anyone would like to add, um, click onto the Q&A button and, um, and off we go. So now we have a question here um, from Ward. What prompted you, Adam, to explore William Buckley's story? Um, the first thing that happened was a friend of mine was an art uh, aficionado. He was at a gallery and he saw a picture of Buckley. And the man apparently said he was related. This, uh, the, the guy who'd done the painting says, I'm related to Buckley. Now, we don't know who's exactly related to Buckley. But my, man, my friend said, oh, I've got a great story for you. It's, it's about the guy that, you know, uh, you know that expression, who's got, you've got Buckley's. Um, uh, and it's about, about this guy. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Why do I know this expression so well? I can't remember not knowing you've got Buckley's. I think down in Victoria, you use the expression a bit differently. It's, but you've got it, Buckley's and none. Uh, and people say it may be related to Buckley's and none, the department store, but that's, that's another story. Um, the point is, I, I, I like, he told me then that this man had lived 32 years, 30 years with the, with what, with the, uh, with the Aboriginal people and came out and he couldn't speak English. So I thought, I sort of remember hearing this story, but we wouldn't have heard this story in Sydney very much. And yet this is the man on which supposedly um, this expression is based. So what does it all mean? And it's, I just became intrigued. And the more I got into it, I thought this is an incredible story about a man who lived with the, as I began in, with the watering at the very moment that Melbourne was created. It's got all the history, it's got a great story and I just delved into it more and more and said, oh, look, this, this is a fantastic story. It's got everything I want. It's got a great actual individual story of Buckley himself. Uh, there's great paintings of Buckley. So he's an icon to some degree. There's a lot of pictures. So it's, there's, there's um, you know, there's paintings related to him. There's the, the idiomatic expression. And then, of course, it's about Melbourne start. And with people like me in Sydney, we haven't got a clue how Melbourne started. Nobody knew. And I didn't know. I was just as dumb as anybody else. We all know about Benelong in Sydney. Let's find out more. I want to, you know, and I just can't, everything about this thing said, screamed, I should do it. And I, and I just checked. I'm sure this, this story has been done as a nonfiction. And at that point, 
it had not been done as a non-fiction. It had been done as a fiction by a man called Robinson, I think, in the 80s. And it was a fiction. Very, very good book. Um, and then uh, whilst I, I was writing it, another book called Buckley's Chance came out. And we were both writing it at the same time, yeah. Gary Linnell. Thanks, Gary. I really appreciate it. No, no, that, absolutely. <laughs> he's, done, he's done an excellent job too. And so for some strange reason, the two of us were writing. He beat me to it. But the two of us were writing a nonfiction at the very same time. So uh, I, I was already halfway through writing it. So I thought, okay, Gary, you've done yours. Mine's coming in five, six months. And here we are. <laughs> so I was a bit late. Oh, but he, he won the race. He won the race. Yes, I'm sure that happened to, to yeah, all Sometimes. <laughs> I, I've never heard it happen exactly. There hadn't been a story for 25 years on Buckley in, in a, in a, in a, from a major public. And then the two of us come out at the same time. Uh, I go figure. <laughs> I mean, this is a bit of a fiction and non-fiction book, really, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's sort of split. Um, which comes to a next question. Um, yep. So, with such a famous fiction author as your father, and an obvious flair for finding the story in history, have you been tempted to try your hand at fiction writing also? Not yet. Never. I'm not, not a big yet. fan. I, no. Um, if you, this is one of my uh, bugbears. My father and I had lots of discussions about the values of fiction and the value of nonfiction. He was an ad man. He believed in the power of the imagination, which is a great thing. And, and some of the greatest books in this world have been written that way. I'm a journalist. Uh, I would both love writing, but we both love different types. I, I don't really like historical fiction. I think it's very well done and it can be great read, but I find it, um, I think it's a cop out. And uh, um, I, I believe personally, you can write a story based on nonfiction that's every bit as good. This Buckley story for one, you couldn't have invented it. it it's that good. Um, so real stories are always better. And if I can tell it in a way that it sounds like a good story that with, with a beginning, middle and end, um, without the false confected happy endings or, uh, you know, and denouement that de is demanded out of a fiction or, you know, um, and my father and I never agreed on this, even to his dying breath. Um, I don't think I'll ever write a fiction, but God, you know, you, you got me now and I might do it, but I, I don't intend to at this point. Uh, I don't really like, I don't believe in writing fiction. I think it's the poor cousin of nonfiction, but th the rest of the world would totally disagree with me. <laughs> upsells non-fiction by 50 to 1. So the answer is, at this point anyway, uh, you never know what will happen, but at this point, no, I don't want to write fiction. I hope that answers. That pretty much answers <laughs> that. <laughs> well, that's a clear answer for that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, so when, Adam, when you're researching, this is from Melissa, how, yep. does, how do you keep track or organise your research and your sources? Yeah, um, pretty haphazardly. Uh, I did, the thing is, I don't, I, I can't tell you, I, I'm very careful to keep things in, um, uh, in in sort of certain piles, but I can't explain to you what, there could be a pile for Batman. There could be a pile for the beginning of Buckley's life. There could be a pile for, and then I have them sort of organised in my brain. But I should say that I don't start, start the writing, um, for at least the first six months. If I got, I got this contract in 2018, I think November or January, I don't think I started writing until roughly about May. Um, and I, I, I'm i really collating these bits of information thinking this is, and I'm almost putting the piles as the chapters would be. Oh, this is for the beginning. This is sort of the middle end. Mm -hmm. um, with that, and, I'm, and every time, I, and all I do for the first six months is read my head off. Um, mm -hmm. I, I go and talk to people. I try and get other points of view. I do everything I can to research um, and then I start writing it. By then, the time I've written it, I've done so much research, five to six months of research, that it's almost in my brain. And then I've got these piles to just check things. So oh, that's for that, that. So I know what I'm going to write by the end of the six months because of all the research that I've done. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not a very formal way of doing things. I, I just sort of put them in a little brain. I call them my brain boxes. You know, that's for the beginning. This is So I, in the end, you'll find sort of, piles like this high of books that relate to that part of where the, the, and then there'll be photocopies and there'll be all kinds of things. And I'll have the same thing on my computer for anything I've got online. 
so it's it's all a bit haphazard but it kind of works in the end <laughs> <laughs> oh look i can relate to you because writing my thesis i if i turn the computer around which i won't there's a big pile of books over there um <laughs> and everybody has their process and method yeah look it's, it's just yeah. individual to each person i think yeah definitely definitely um next question from sally I wondered if Buckley has any surviving family and did he die alone or did he have a family? Uh, good, really good question. Um, there's, uh, I think I say in the book, we don't, there's two women that he refers to. One that he was formerly married to, but he says it didn't work out. And then I mentioned earlier that he went on his own uh, and went, went for a, uh, he basically went to the coast and lived on his own. And there he was supposed to have met, um, a woman, and forgive my pronunciation, Turin Murin Purin Min, I think, excuse me, but that was her name. I can't say it very well. Please forgive me. Um, but he was meant, to, and she was meant to be a 15 year old um, uh, woman from, I think, an area around um, uh, Ballarat, uh, from a tribe around there. I just can't remember offhand the name of it. And they were meant to have formed a liaison for several years. Now, but, but in the Morgan account, we don't hear about any any particular children, there are no children um, mentioned at all, but yet we hear first some first-hand accounts of there being children around. Now, um, uh, I think it was Thomas, one of the, he was one of the people who was charged in the later years uh, of, he, he has a journal, um, that's his first name, here we go again, my lack of memory. He mentions a grandchild of Buckley in the 1880s, Mm -hmm. uh, was in jail. She said, I'm his granddaughter. There's right. another, another in, 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 I think it's Thomas again. Uh, he, he, was a, in the, he was a protector, so protector, called protector yeah. of the Aborigines. He mentioned uh, at some point two sons in the 1840s or 50s, I think, of, who were there by then about in their 20s. But we don't, we just can't put a mother to them and we can't, we don't know who he's linked to. Mm -hmm. You asked about family. He married um, Julia Eager, uh, who was an, an Irish lady who was about, you know, they laugh at this. He married her when she lost her husband, when he went to Tasmania after 1837. Uh, they got married. She had lost his hu her own husband. And they, they were too, I think she was too old to have children by that time. But she had a daughter. So he had a mm -hmm. surrogate daughter, if you like. Um, uh, sorry, a uh, daughter, in, yeah, uh, stepdaughter. Um, and um, she was apparently four foot eight. He had to prop her up when they were walking down the, down the street. That was the story that it went. So yes, he did have a, a stepdaughter, uh, but they say that he may have had plenty of children, but we don't know, you know, we just don't know yeah. who they were, who the mothers were. And they're, they're, so you yeah. can't link him to anybody in particular for, his, for a natural birth there. Right. Well, very interesting. There you go, yep. yeah. Um, now, a couple of comments. Um, so this is from Helene. Hi, Adam. I'm wanting to offer my encouragement to continue writing Australian history. You have such a wonderful style of writing. Oh, for shucks. Me, <laughs> Thank you. For me, yeah. suffering attention deficit disorder, I have trouble concentrating on reading, yet your style is so engaging for me. Please oh, continue to write anything, but love the Australian history. Your research is impeccable. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Look, it's a Bryce Courtney style, but an Adam oh. Courtney facts, right? That's what it is. It uh, makes it readable. <laughs> uh, there was another comment um, from the Geelong Heritage Centre who, yep. um, who they say that um, they've been lost count of the number of requests that they've had at the Geelong Heritage Centre for information about Buckley. Oh, really? Right. Um, okay. And they hope that, to have more requests for information. For, for information um, yeah. about Buckley and um, and Wadaran and that this um, demonstrates the power of reconciliation in an important form. Yeah, now they were very, very helpful. They, I, I organised when I came down to Geelong in the very beginning when I was just starting, the Geelong Heritage Centre gave me everything they had on Buckley, it didn't matter what, and that was just fabulous. Mm. I found out some really great stuff and I thank them, I think, in the end of the book because they were really helpful just to get me going on the basics. And it was, so my thanks to them. And I'm glad to hear that this is stimulating interest. Uh, fantastic. Um, now, look, we've got to wrap it up because we've, we've, we've run out of time. So- um, Oh no. 
bear with me. That's when we started getting going. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but look, so we will, we did have a couple more questions there, but I think um, we we might wrap it up. It's nearly 8.30. So yeah, get in like, time. I would like to thank you so much, Adam, for oh, it's joining a pleasure. us and, and this and evening. Um, and can I thank everybody who, who really listened in and, you know, I feel I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm really honoured to be broadcasting to Wadawurrung Territory uh, because you guys really know what this is about more than I did and probably still know more than I do. But, you know, I'm really, really honoured to have done this and I hope to come in person next time um, and, and see you all. That'd be great. Fantastic. It's been lovely to meet you and to hear about your story this evening. So thanks, Adam. Thank you, thank you for having me and thanks for coming. So for you, the audience, copies of The Ghost and the Bounty Hunter are available to borrow from the Geelong Library um, website in e-book, e-audio book and hard copy formats. And of course, you can purchase the book from any good bookstore. I have seen ABC um, adverts recently promoting your book, Adam. So that's oh, yes. Yes. A, a, a great sign as well. Thank you, ABC. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and people are reading more at the moment, being in isolation as well. So it's a good time. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, look. Can... Yeah. Now check out the library's Facebook page for more up upcoming events, including a special event next week where we present a panel discussion on youth mental health. And that's brought to you in conjunction with Headspace. That will be a fantastic event. Please do join. And on behalf of the library, thank you all for joining us and good night. Good night.